Good morning. Good morning. I heard a story this week on the radio that really grabbed the hole of me. Every year there's a 500 mile extreme race in Australia. It starts off in Melbourne. It attracts elite triathletes and Ironmen from all over the planet. And in 1983, a 61-year-old man named Cliff Young registered to run. He was wearing overalls and galoshes over his work boots, and the race officials thought it was a joke, so they tried to prevent him from signing up. They said, what makes you think that you're prepared for such a race? And this is what he told them. He said his family owns a 2,000-acre farm, and it's always been his job to round up the sheep if there was bad weather in the forecast. They didn't have enough money for vehicles, so he would run to gather up the 2,000 sheep. And sometimes it would take three days of continual running to get the sheep. So he felt as though that prepared him for the big race. The officials reluctantly let Cliff run. And at the start of the race, the runners were all there, and he was in the back of the pack. And they all took off and left him in the dust. But I actually verified the legitimacy of the story. They actually have a video picture of him running. And he's barely moving his feet. It's a shuffle. It's more like this. And so they all got way ahead of him. And he just plodded along in his big old galoshes. Apparently, though, the 61-year-old sheep-chasing farmer did not know that the runners stopped each night to sleep and just kept on running through the night, three days straight. And not only did he win the race, but he broke the former record by nine hours. Yeah. After the race, Cliff said that, you know, he just imagined that he was chasing after sheep trying to outrun a storm. Pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. There's a storm brewing in this country, and it doesn't have anything to do with wind or rain or snow or thunder and lightning. I think that the storm that I'm speaking about today has to do with the lack of quality leadership. And just as Cliff Young was prepared for his race, we need to be prepared for ours. Now, naturally, we think of the office of president Naturally, we think, you know, it's an election season, so, you know, we're we're talking about that leadership position. I'm not. I'm not. I do believe that we need strong, quality leaders in our government, but I also believe that, and this is going to be hard for us to handle, I also believe that what we have simply is a reflection of what we are, quite frankly. And I don't believe that the answer to our current storm can be resolved in our government until it's resolved in our homes. Now, hear me out. I'm not saying that the government has no factor in it. It absolutely does. But I think first and foremost, if our government's going to be what it needs to be, our homes and our churches and our communities need to be what we need to be first. It's very easy to point at the White House and say, there's a problem there. And we may be right, but it's another thing altogether to point in the mirror and say, there's a problem here. I can't fix the White House. I cannot walk in there and change the direction. What I can do is I can lead right in my own life, in my home, in my church, in my community. I can do what I need to do. I can be right with God. We need to lead. We need to be prepared like Cliff Young was prepared. We need to prepare our families I believe every child of God is called to lead in the kingdom of God. If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I believe God has placed His hand upon you and said, now go and lead. I don't believe that we're supposed to come to the Lord and then sit back and enjoy the ride. I believe we're supposed to get out front and start leading and start doing. And I get that from Matthew chapter 5, beginning of verse 14, says, you bar the light of the world. He's speaking to believers here. A city set on a hill cannot be hid, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In that same way, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father, which is in heaven. Leadership can be summed up with one word, and that's influence. Leaders influence others and direct them and guide them. Our light shines in this world. If our light will shine in this world the way it's supposed to, Everyone's going to see that, and it's going to influence them. Last night, I'm the one that usually has the headache, but last night Angela had a little bit of a headache, and she had the light out, and I flicked the light on. 
It didn't just affect me. It affected her, you know. And we need to be lights in this world to affect the people that are around us. We need to live in such a way that our lives make a difference. We need to lead in such a way that our lives make a difference. If we, the children of God, will lead our families the way they're supposed to be led and lead our church the way it's supposed to be led and lead our communities the way they're supposed to be led, the government's going to have to take notice. And furthermore, think about this. If our generation leads our homes the way we're supposed to be according to God's word, guess where the leaders of the next generation are going to come from? Those godly homes. And we will be changing the course of our country. We will be stemming the storm. We will be going in the direction that we need to go. The 61-year-old sheep farmer who shocked the world by winning the ultra marathon did it because he was prepared. He did not just walk up there and say, I think I'm going to run 500 miles today. He had a lifetime of preparing for that race. We need to prepare. And that's exactly where we are in our journey through the Bible. Turn with me, please, to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Remember, we left off where Moses got the Ten Commandments and then we had the situation with the golden calf. And then there was a 40-year period in between there of wilderness wandering that we're going to be looking at a little bit as we go over the next couple of weeks. This is kind of a mini-series within the series, which is what we do a lot. And I'm calling this Courageous Leadership. What's it take to lead courageously? And today... The topic today is answering the call to lead. You and I have been called by God to lead. We need to be ready to respond and to do that. And we see that at the end of this 40 years, Moses dies. The leader dies. And there's a vacuum. What are they going to do? Well, God wasn't taken by surprise. He had somebody prepared. And his name was Joshua. And Joshua answered the call. And I want to say this right from the beginning. I believe that every child of God is called by God to do something for God. It's that simple. If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God has called you to do something in His kingdom. Not just to sit back and receive, but to also do, get involved in God's kingdom, to answer the call. And how do we do all this? Well, let's take a look at what happened with Joshua. Joshua in chapter 1 It says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, unto the land which I give unto them, even to the children of Israel. God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. God delivered the Ten Commandments to his people. God delivered food and water to them all through the wilderness wanderings. He did it all through the leadership of Moses. Moses died. Now God is going to deliver unto them a new leader, somebody to fill those shoes, somebody to fill the gap. And he calls out to Joshua. And Joshua answers. But Joshua needed a couple of character qualities in order to be prepared to answer the call. And that's where we are today. You can follow along in your notes. If we're going to answer the call of God, we need to have certain qualifications. And the first one is, we need to believe. We need to believe. Sounds so simple. Sounds so simple. If I asked right now, how many of you believe in God? Every hand would probably go. But when the Bible uses the word believe, for as many as believed on Him or called upon His name, it's talking about a commitment, a total, complete commitment of your belief. It's not just, yeah, I believe that, um, you know, if it gets above 90 degrees, it's hot. That's, that's not the kind of belief that, th- that they're talking about. This is a commitment to belief. And one of the best examples is you guys are all doing it right now, believe it or not. You guys are all exhibiting this kind of belief right now by sitting in the chairs that you're sitting in. You believe that those chairs can hold you up, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting in them. It sounds ludicrous, but if I walk over to the chair, uh, yeah, I believe that the chair's there, but I'm not going to sit in it because it might not hold me. No. By the commitment of sitting in the chair, you're saying, I believe the chair can hold me up. That's the type of belief that he's talking about. It's not just believing about God. It's not just believing that there is a God, but it's putting our complete trust and resting ourselves in that belief, in who he is. And Joshua had this. He exhibited it from the beginning. 
I remember when the 12 spies were sent out to the promised land to spy the land, and they were supposed to come back with a report. And they all came back with a very similar report. Yes, it is the promised land. It is beautiful beyond belief. They all agree. Absolutely, it is definitely flowing with milk and honey. It is incredible. It would take care of our families for generations to come. They all agree. And then all of a sudden, there was a disagreement. They said yes to everything else, but then they said, no, we cannot possibly take this land because the people are too strong for us. Two of the spies disagreed, Joshua and Caleb. And this is what was said in Numbers chapter 14, beginning in verse 7. The land which we pass through to search it, it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which flows with milk and honey. God is telling us, guess what? I'm sending my people in there. The people come back and say, yeah, he's right. It's incredible. But 10 of them say, no, I don't think so. Joshua and Caleb say, yeah. And then they go on to say this, only rebel not against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defenses departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. That's belief. This is Joshua saying, yeah, we don't have any weapons. Remember, they came out of slavery in Egypt. We don't have any weapons, but guess what? We can take this land because God said he's going to give it to us. That's belief. That's the kind of committed belief it takes to answer the call of God. It's the first mark of leadership. Joshua believed in who God said he was and was willing to commit his life and his everything to it. The rest of the spies, think about this for a second. The rest of the spies saw the promised land and in sight of the promised land, turned their backs to it. That would be like running in a marathon. How many of you have ran in any kind of race? Any kind of race. Okay. 5K. Anybody run in a 5K? Okay. Now imagine this. You're running in the 5K and you're doing great. Your best time ever. And you get and you see the finish line about 50 feet off. And you stop and you say, No, and you turn around and run the other way. How ludicrous would that be? Right? Bob, you wrote in a couple marathons. What would it be like that you were in 22 and 5 tenths of a mile? Because it's 22 and 6 tenths of a mile, right? All right, you come just inside of that. You run the whole thing. You pour yourself in there. You come inside of the finish line and you, no. And you turn around and walk the other way because you can't run anymore. You're tired. That would be ludicrous. We look at that and we think, okay, Pastor, that's the dumbest statement you've ever made. That's exactly what they did. They went through and they get out of 400 plus years of slavery, see the deliverance of the Lord, and they get up to the promised land and say, no, we can't, we're going to turn back. It's the same thing, only more so. It's incredible. Their unbelief disqualified them from leadership. Joshua's belief qualified him to answer the call of God. Joshua was being prepared during this time. He was being prepared for something beyond himself. And that's what leaders do. Leaders lead beyond themselves. Leaders of God lead beyond themselves. They lead beyond their ability, beyond their problems even. They lead beyond themselves. And in Joshua chapter 10, he and the children of Israel come up against five kings and their armies. And the Lord told Joshua that he was with them and that the Israelites would win the day. Okay? Joshua believed and attacked a force greater than his own. The enemy ran, but Joshua was not about to stop. You see, your average leader at that point would have seen the victory as the victory. But Joshua saw something more, because Joshua believed. Joshua began to see the sun setting down, and he knew that if the sun set, as the enemy was running away, they would attack again and again and again. Now, keep in mind, God just gave him an incredible victory, okay? And Joshua believed them, went out, and God gave Israel an incredible victory. It was one army against five, okay? But it wasn't enough. He saw more. He believed God was even greater than that. So he does something that can only be explained by faith. He actually, he actually asked God to stop the sun in the middle of the sky. I mean, think about that. He actually says, Lord, stop the sun. Now, I know if you're a scientist, somebody who studies the sky, you're going to say, impossible. 
No way God can stop the sun without it causing incredible ramifications around the entire universe. You're absolutely right. But he did it anyway. Because he's God. He's greater than my science. He's greater than my understanding of gravity and centrifugal force and the effects of all that. He's greater than that. And Joshua knew that. And listen to the way he says it here. In Joshua chapter 10, beginning of verse 12. Joshua spoke to the Lord. So he's in prayer before the Lord. In the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight... I love this part. See, Joshua was not that wishy-washy behind the scenes. Okay, I'm going to pray this and if it happens, then I'll take credit for it kind of guy. He just... He was out there. He said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jeshar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. Now, this is not Leadership 101. This is crazy talk. This can only be explained by a complete and total trust in God and who He says that He is. I mean, think about that. How many of us would ever even think of going out and saying, okay, God, You promised this. Make the sun stand still. Make the sun just stop for a whole day. That's belief. Joshua was prepared to answer the call of God and he exhibits it here in his belief. And he doesn't do it in private. He doesn't do it behind the scenes. He doesn't do it half-heartedly. He does it openly with confidence in God. You want to show somebody your confidence in God, pray for somebody in the presence of that person or somebody else. A lot of people ask me to, to pray for them because they're sick or something like that. And, you know, a lot of times, okay, I will definitely keep you in prayer, but there's those times where God says, no, do it now. Do it now. Stand up for me now. I pray, Lord, that you heal this person. Right now. Right in front of them. That's belief. Joshua exhibits it better than anyone that I can think of. Son, stand still. Incredible. This is the kind of belief that we need to have if we're going to answer the call of God. If we're going to be available for God, for God to use in His plan, we got to believe. we got to believe and trust in God and who He is. Take a look at Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. Oh, the Lord, it says, Behold, Thou hast made the heaven and the earth by Thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for you. How many of you believe that? Think about that. And, I mean, we're in church, so we think a different way in church sometimes than we're at home. Okay, let's be honest. We all probably do it from time to time. But I want you to think about the question. Do you really believe this? Do you believe it when the economy is crashing? Do you believe it when you have a sickness in the family or difficulty in marriages or job problems? Do you believe this during those times? Because quite honestly, right now, in our faith family, sitting here, it's pretty easy to believe that this is the kind of God that we serve. What about when you're all alone? facing the trial, facing the difficulty, facing the struggle that is way beyond you. Do you believe it then? That's the kind of belief that we're talking about. If we're going to lead our families, our church, our community, we need to, like Joshua, not just believe about God, but believe in Him. Believe that He can make the sun stand still. Because quite honestly, if He can make the sun stand still, He can handle anything in my life quite easily. So we need to believe. And not just that superficial belief, but a real true belief. A belief that's tested by fire. Why do bad things happen to good people? How many of you have heard that question? Or asked that question? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why? To prepare us for something greater. To get us to a point where we can trust in Him. If everything's always, oh, sweet and nice and so on, when the troubles come, we're not going to be prepared. Think of Cliff Young. Imagine running that 500-mile marathon when the longest distance he ever ran before that was about 100 yards, he would have trouble. He wouldn't make it. But you think, oh, for 61 years or whatever it was that he was doing, he ran 2,000 acres and, you know, whenever there was a storm, my goodness, that must have been difficult. That must have been hard. Yeah, absolutely. But when it came time for the test, he was prepared. If we're going to believe in our God We're going to have to go through the difficult times and still believe in our God, not just when times are good. But that's not all. We also must serve. 
We also must serve. Joshua was prepared for leadership by first being a servant. Servant leadership, by the way, is all but lost today. People want the perks of leadership without understanding that true leadership springs from a servant's heart. It truly does. Exodus chapter 24, verse 13 says this, Moses rose up and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. That's the beginning of the wilderness wanderings, by the way. That's all the way back at the very beginning. They were delivered from Egypt. Okay, they get before the mountain of God. And what do they call Joshua? Moses' minister. Minister in, in the Hebrew, by the way, means servant or attendant. So he started out, okay, he started out as a servant. He served Moses. Now, take a look at what happens here. You think, okay, I'm starting out here and I'm going to climb the corporate ladder. That's what people do, right? You get a job and you do well and you climb the corporate ladder and so on and so forth. Let me ask you this. What would you do? How many of you have been with a company for a very long time? You've been with a company for a very long time. Excellent. What would happen? Think of the first job you had at that company. Okay? Now, well, my first job was on a farm, but my first legitimate job, I guess, was as a dishwasher. Okay? Think about this. The boss comes up to you and says, Hey, Bob, if you do right, guess what? You'll climb the corporate ladder. Great. So that first job you had, great. You're excited. You're ready to go. And then 40 years go by. And then the promotion. How many of us would even th- think of us? I, Rodney's back there thinking, you've got to be kidding me. But this is exactly what happened. Joshua 1.1, he still called Moses' minister. Forty years later, he was still a servant. He still had a servant's heart. He didn't at any point, we don't have any record of him at any point saying, hey Moses, how about, uh, how about a raise? How about a promotion there, buddy? I, I've been serving you for a whole year now. One of the big problems with kids coming out of the colleges today is they're coming out expecting to be where their parents are after their parents have served for, you know, 20, 20 some odd years. The kids are coming out of college, they're going for jobs, and they're passing on jobs that are paying well because they want to be up here. That's a problem. You've got to work. And the best way to do this is to serve. And that's what he did here. For 40 years, he served from a servant's heart. He had a great example. You know, the most common title for Moses is servant of the Lord. Not general, not captain of Israel, not leader of the people, but servant of the Lord. It's mentioned 22 times throughout the Bible. And as a matter of fact, it's memorialized for all eternity. As we read in Revelation chapter 15, verse 3, it says, They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. So in the future, in eternity future, guess what? He's still known as a servant. It goes on to to talk about the song that he's saying. This is a proper way to be a servant is to realize who your master is. It says, and the song of the Lamb saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. (laughs) One of the greatest leaders of all time is known as a servant first. That's incredible. If we're going to lead our families, our church, our communities, we're going to have to understand that our position as leaders give us... Now, I want you to hear this. Our position as leaders give us the authority to serve. Sounds like an oxymoron. Our position as children of God gives us the authority to serve. If we can see it that way, we'll understand what they're trying to tell us here. I want you to digest that for a moment. It's not about entitlement. It's not about being a big shot. It's about we're children of God. God now gives us the authority to serve each other and to serve the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 says this, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Serve one another. It's what we're supposed to do. It's not about fame and fortune. True leadership is servanthood first. I read a story about during the Nazi occupation in Denmark during World War II and King Christian X of Denmark noticed a Nazi flag hanging over one of his buildings, lifted up on one of his buildings in his country. Now, Nazis, they occupied the country, but the king saying, we're not going to put up with this. You're not going to put your flag up in one of my public buildings. So he called the commandant, the German commandant, 
and demanded that the flag be taken down at once, and the commandant refused. He said, no, we're not taking it down. We're occupying your country. The king said this. The king said, then I'm going to send a soldier over there to take the flag down. The commandant said, you send the soldier over here, he'll be shot. This is what the king said. He said, I think not, for I shall be that soldier. <laughs> Within moments, the flag was down. Here's a guy, he's the king, and he's saying, something needs to be done. I'm going to do it. I'm going to serve. I'm not above that. And he did it. And he exhibited servant leadership. You want to know the best way to influence somebody, the best way to lead somebody? Serve them. Put their best interests in mind. I said that to my Amanda last week. I said, Amanda, no other man on the planet will have your best interests in mind like I do. Trust me. She looked at me. She said, okay, Daddy. I said the same thing to Alana yesterday. Alana, no other man on the planet will have your best interests in mind like your daddy. We lead that way. We guide that way by serving each other, by putting each other first. And then, you know, because leadership isn't the big boss man with the whip cracking the whip. Leadership is what? What's the word? What's the one word definition? Influence. Influence. <laughs> not afraid to serve. If we're going to lead our families, our church, and our community like Joshua, we must not be afraid to serve each other in the kingdom of God. And finally, we must persevere. We must persevere. Remember, Joshua missed going into the promised land because of somebody else's unbelief. I have to wrap my mind around this at times because, you know, I think, okay, he and Caleb came back and said, yeah, we can do it. The other ten said no. As a matter of fact, the people even threatened to stone Joshua and Caleb. So the children of Israel decided to, in the sight of the promised land, turn and walk away. I often think, what went through his mind? During that time, he was going to do what was right. He was going to do what was right. Yet he was suffering for the decision of others. How many of you think that's unfair? Come on. I think that's unfair. Suffering for the decisions of others. I think that's kind of unfair, quite honestly. And that's what was going on here. But he persevered to the end. I wonder, do you think he ever had his moments of doubt and bitterness during this time? Do you think maybe he ever got angry? Talk about Joshua now. They're walking away from the promised land. It's right there. He was in it. And he's like, man, this place is incredible. Let's do it. God can do it. And the people, no, we're not going to do it. We're walking away. I can almost picture Joshua and Caleb kind of hanging back at the back of the pile, looking at the Holy Land, looking at the people. What in the world is going on? And going with the people, do you think he ever felt sorry for himself? Maybe. We don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us. I think most people would feel these things. And well, would you feel this way? Think about it. Think about that. How would you feel in Joshua's shoes? I feel like, Lord, can I take that offer that you gave Moses? Destroy them and make a nation of me? I'll go in there. I mean, think about that. He was going to do what was right. And they said, no. No. And for the next 40 years, Joshua had to put up with that. That's perseverance. During that ultramarathon, Cliff Young was asked what his secret for running this race was. He smiled and said, I just keep going. That's all. That's my secret. I just don't quit. I just keep going. Remember the Finding Nemo with the little fish, Dory? Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. You'll have that song stuck in your head all day, too. I've had it all morning. Good for you. But that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to keep on going. Never give up. Our God is eternal. Our God isn't king today and not king tomorrow. If he was, then we'd go for it today and tomorrow we quit. Our God is king forever. So we follow him forever. Take a look at Philippians, how Paul put it in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. I love that. He was so narrow-minded. I love that. He was so focused. This one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Great leaders persevere no matter what, regardless of the opposition, regardless of the circumstances or the setbacks. True leaders persevere. They don't make up excuses. They don't wallow in self-pity. 
They don't blame others. I heard this statement this week and it's riveted me. They don't see themselves as wounded victims, but rather as scarred warriors. Think about that. Wrap your mind around that. Do you want the world to see you as a wounded victim or as scarred warriors? That changes everything. You're going to think about that. I'll tell you what. I shared it with Pastor Donald yesterday morning. He called me back at like 8 o'clock at night and said, I got it. That makes total sense. That changes everything. If I'm, woe is me, my life stinks, I had a bad upbringing, I had, oh, you know, and I become a pitiful little self-centered thing, always about my hurt. There's two ways of looking at that. Those things can turn me into that jellyfish of a non-man. Or those things can be looked at as, you know, those are wounds that stay open. I'm a scarred warrior. I've gone through the battle and come out on the other side. How many of you want to go through the battle, come out on the other side, rather than lay on the field and say, oh, I got hurt. I want to come through the battle. I played football not very well. I was always smaller than a lot of the guys. But I started all the time because the coach said that I was crazy. And I didn't really get what he was trying to say. I thought, you know, at first I thought, okay, is he making fun of me? What's he doing? But later on I figured out every single play I gave 100%. And there was one time I broke my leg in the game and I got up and I limped over to the huddle to continue to play. And the coach is like, what are you doing? Get out of there. I'm like, no, I'm okay. I got ran over the next play, and I stayed on the ground a little bit longer that time. But they dragged me off the field, x-rayed the leg, got a broken leg. I actually played a down with a broken leg. That was my claim to fame, you know. But guess what happened? When I made it back to football, guess who the hero was for getting run over? Me. Because I didn't land a field. I got a boo-boo. I'm a wounded victim. No, it was, uh, it's a scar. It happens. It's football. Guess what? Life happens. It's the way it is. And we're either going to not persevere and be the wounded victim and say, woe is me and all about me, or we're going to persevere and say, it's scars. I'm a warrior. It's a scar. Big deal. You know what the warriors and the soldiers used to do? They used to show their scars. Take a look at this one. This one goes all the way up here. Oh, yeah, look at this one. Look at this one. I lost my arm, man. Isn't that great? Now, you're looking at me like, is he serious? I am serious. I am serious. Tom, in the military, who are the most respected people? The medics. <laughs> the ones that get hurt and persevere. You guys look at them and you're like, man, that's, that's a soldier. That's a warrior. The most coveted one is the medic, of course. <laughs> but that's what Joshua did. Joshua said, I'm not going to spend 40 years, but these people, these people are whining. I could be in the promised land. I wanted to do the right thing. Boo-hoo. He said, let's do it. Let's go for it. He gets to the end of the 40 years. He's persevered. He is now ready to answer the call of God. Perseverance. Sir Edmund Hillary was kind of like that. He attempted to climb Mount Everest in 1952. And a few weeks later, after his failed attempt, he was asked to speak in England. And he walked up to the stage and made a fist. And there was a big picture of Mount Everest. He made a fist at the picture. And this is what he said. He said, Everest, you beat me the first time, but I'll beat you the next time. Because you've grown all you're going to grow, but I'm still growing. That's perseverance. And on May 29th, 1953, only a year later, Sir Edmund Hillary was the first person to climb Mount Everest and make it to the top. Perseverance. Never quitting. Never surrendering. If God is going to use you as a leader, He needs you and I to be perseverers. Never quit. Never give up. If we're going to be able to answer the call of God, that's what we got to be. And the benefits are, are sweet. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 8. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Perseverance brings us to the end, and the end is sweet. I like the way Spurgeon puts it. By perseverance, the snail reached the ark. Yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. I mean, come on, man. By perseverance, the snail ended up getting to the ark. We need to persevere. If we're going to lead our families, our church, our community, we, like Joshua, must persevere. So Joshua answers the call of God because he was prepared by God to believe, to serve, and to persevere. And his answer to the call is summed up in Joshua 24, verse 15. Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served 
that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's Joshua's attitude. His attitude is, I'm answering the call of God. What about you? What's your choice? What's your choice? Joshua's saying, not only am I going to answer the call of God, but I'm going to lead my family to answer the call of God as well. And that has left a legacy. There was a mother and a small daughter. They walked past in Springfield, Illinois. Abraham Lincoln spent a lot of his childhood there and some of his adult time there. And they were walking by and they saw that there was a light on. It's a museum now. There was a light on in there and it gave the house kind of a warm glow. I don't know if you've ever seen the house. It's a pretty neat little tiny thing. And the lights were on. And as they paused for a few minutes, the mother looked at the daughter and said, as she was talking about how great President Lincoln was and how the whole entire country mourned at his death. And she was wide-eyed looking at the house and a little frown on her face. You could tell she was trying to figure something out. She's looking. And this is what she said as she was noticing the glow in the windows. She said, look, Mama, when Mr. Lincoln went away, he left the lights on. (laughs) His life has left an impact. He's left the lights on. We read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, talking about Abel, said, He being dead, yet speaketh. Your life and my life will speak long after we're gone if we answer the call of God today. Let's pray. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Joshua is one of my favorite people in Scripture. He was a man's man. He was a leader of men. But he was a servant first. He believed God with every ounce of his being and served God with every ounce of his being and persevered for God with every ounce of his being. And that made him eligible to hear and answer the call of God. I believe that every single person in this room who has called upon Jesus' name as Lord and Savior can be just like this. I crave, I hunger, I strive to be like this. And I know you do too. And I'm going to pray for each and every one of you in a moment. But maybe you came in here today and maybe you don't have that relationship with God like Joshua did. Maybe you don't know Him as Lord and Savior. Maybe you don't have a confidence that you're going to be in heaven someday. I don't know. Maybe you don't. I'm looking around. I see a lot of people that I know, but I never want to assume. So I want to lay it out there. Jesus said, I got a call for you. I got a call to salvation. I got a call to heaven. Are you ready to answer that call? Many of us would say, no, okay, we're not leaders. I don't have the, quote, gift of leadership. Or I'm not a natural born leader. You might feel that way, but God has other plans. But this one thing is true. God is calling you to salvation. My Bible says he's not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want you and I not to be in heaven. He wants us there. And if you're here today and you have not called upon his name you have not committed your trust your belief your faith in him do it now don't wait don't put it off do it now and you can do it by calling upon his name right now you can pray just like this here's what the bible says the bible says if you call upon the name of the lord you shall be saved how do you do that you can do it just like this right where you are you can say lord i'm not perfect i have sinned and i'm sorry Now say this. Say, Lord, right now, this moment, as best as I know how, I answer the call. The call to be your child. The call for you to be my Savior. And I place my faith, my trust, and my hope in you right now. If you just prayed that prayer with me, I so much want to pray for you. I'm not going to make you jump up and down or anything like that, but I'd like to know who you are because I so much want to pray for you throughout the week. If you just pray that prayer with me, with all, anybody else looking around, could you do me a favor? Lift up your hand. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you saw the hands. More importantly, you saw the hearts. Father, I ask that you would be with the three that called upon your name today. Lord, that you would make your presence known to them in a special way. Lord, that you would guide them and direct them to a deeper knowledge of you. Protect them, Lord. 
Help them to see you in a brand new light. Father, help us all to answer the call. The call to lead. For us men, give us the strength, the courage to lead our families. To believe enough in you that you can do it. To serve our wives and our children and to persevere into the end. Father, for the wives in here and the moms in here and the women in here, their leadership is just as important. Father, I ask that you would give them the courage as well to lead, to be strong in you. Father, for the children in here, Lord, there is no age limitation when it comes to leadership. There is a child of God and that is the qualification. I ask that you be with our 180 group, Lord, our teenage. I love them so much, Father. They have inspire me daily. Lord, strengthen them. Give them the courage to lead. And those that are younger, Lord, Father, help us all to answer the call. We love you. We come to you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.